Welcome this afternoon to uh, our session on prioritizing health to rebuild the economy. I think it's a very, very important discussion to have, Jill, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful that uh, we're, we're able to have such an esteemed panel of, uh, of, of folks this afternoon. If this pandemic has, has really highlighted one thing, it certainly has highlighted the significant link between health and economy, health systems and economy. And I'm hoping that uh, through the panel discussion the afternoon, this afternoon, we're going to be able to get at some of that. Um, we're very, very fortunate this afternoon to have uh, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation, and, uh, and our Trade Minister from Ontario here. The other thing we've really noticed is the cooperation between the federal and provincial government. Uh, and, and we saw that in, um, in the federal uh, investment office being here yesterday. But the great good fortune of Ontario is we have a bit of a secret weapon in, uh, in Minister Fideli. He really is a, an amazing uh, minister. He's a, a lifelong entrepreneur, successful businessman, uh, and a former two-term mayor uh, in North Bay in Ontario. He's someone who very well understands the challenges that uh, that the province faces, both large international global organizations as well as uh, small to medium-sized businesses. So uh, I I couldn't be any happier that uh, that the minister is with us this afternoon to bring some opening remarks. And I can't see him, but I assume he's somewhere in uh, the virtual world there. So with that, uh, can we invite the minister to make some remarks? Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, I can see you, incidentally, and uh, you look great. It's great to see you again, uh, and uh, I want to say good afternoon to everyone. Today's discussion is an opportunity to come together as members of our global community and international marketplace. Together, uh, we'll tackle the collective challenges we face in the fight against COVID-19 and beyond. Our government knows that our health and our economic vitality are absolutely linked. Prioritizing health to rebuild the economy as a concept has guided our government's economic recovery response. At the outset of this pandemic, we were faced with a situation. Critical supplies such as ventilators, masks, hand sanitizer, wipes, and other essential PPE were hard to find and in short supply. Our traditional supply lines were suddenly vulnerable. We had to think creatively and act decisively to leverage our assets to confront this challenge. With Ontario uh, as home to one of the best life, sec uh, life sciences sectors in the world and known as the manufacturing economic engine of Canada, we acted fast to mobilize our strengths. Our life sciences and med tech sectors joined forces with our manufacturing might to fight against the threat to our health and to our economy. And to support this, our government created the Ontario Together program. We put the call out for our businesses to innovate, collaborate, pivot their production lines to produce life-saving PPE for our frontline workers, and we were not disappointed. Businesses from across the province came through with their supplies, their innovations, their ideas to help protect vulnerable people and businesses in Ontario. It's something we like to call the Ontario spirit. It's our ability to see those opportunities within the challenges. Challenges like a rapidly evolving environment that demands quick responses and innovative solutions. We developed the Ontario Together Fund to help some of those most viable, in-demand proposals get off the ground quickly. To date, we funded 14 companies and two organizations through the program, including medical technology businesses, CleanWorks, uh, CleanWorks Medical, Metric Aid, South Medic, and Microbics. We will continue to leverage our strengths in the life science and innovation sectors and ensure that these strengths are partnered with our manufacturing might to support within our borders and around the world. Now, looking ahead, as global economies begin to reopen and recover, Ontario is ideally positioned to be a safe haven of growth and stability in North America. 
Ontario is the natural partner for global con uh, companies in the life sciences and medtech sectors who are seeking to establish or grow their presence in North America. And a few reasons uh, they consider Ontario include our talent. Ontario's number one advantage is our people. Our 44 incredi incredible public universities and colleges produce about 50,000 STEM grads each and every year. And currently there are 68,000 people working in Ontario's vibrant life sciences sector in more than 1,900 companies. Our welcoming approach to immigration expands our talent pool even further while producing different perspectives that enrich our culture of innovation. Our next is our innovation ecosystem. Ontario has one of the most unique and collaborative innovation ecosystems on the entire planet. Business, academia, government, we all work together to drive revolutionary ideas to market. And through our many consultations and our meetings within your sector, we know that strategic procurement is a key ingredient for spurring innovation. Ontario is Canada's largest centre for life sciences activity, the sector's growth being fueled by our embrace of emerging technology. Ontario boasts well over 300 AI firms working at the cutting edge of innovation in science, including Blue Dot, Cyclica and Deep Genomics, uh, and other industry leaders such as Roche, Abbott, Stryker, Sanofi and Siemens, uh, Siemens Health and Ears, just to name a few, call Ontario home. Our competitive business costs, Ontario continues to enjoy one of the lowest corporate income tax rates in North America. By performing R&D in Ontario, small and medium-sized manufacturers can save up to 50% on their after-tax expenditures. We're also making it easier for companies to do business in the province. Reducing regulatory burdens on companies has always been a top priority for our government. We know today's global marketplace is, puts a premium on speed, and that's another Ontario advantage. Our access to global markets, doing business in Ontario means being open for business to the rest of the world. With Canada's free trade agreements with about 50 countries, it's never been easier to grow your worldwide business in Ontario. Uh, we're only a short distance to major U.S. hubs. Ontario has access to more than 143 million consumers within just a day's drive of the Greater Toronto Area. Most recently, Roche announced a $500 million investment to establish a global pharma technical operations site to oversee its global supply chain in Ontario here. This is further proof that Ontario has the best environment for jobs and opportunity. It positions us as a leader in the life-saving medicines, diagnostics and medical equipment. The many innovative members of our province's medtech and life sciences sector who are here today stepped up to the challenge in these past several months. Thank you for everything you've done and continue to do as we work together to place health at the forefront of our mission to rebuild our economy. I hope you have a great rest of the forum, everyone. Thank you. Well, Minister, thank you very kindly for your for your comments this morning or this afternoon. Ontario spirit, uh, I can tell you, is alive and well. And if I could just uh, underscore that the publicly funded healthcare system in Ontario is the single largest system of its kind in North America, and it has absolutely risen to the challenge uh, during this pandemic. And there is no question in my mind that our health system, our education system, and the people in this province uh, are second to none. And uh, there's no question that this is the best place in the world to live, work, grow your business, and raise a family. So. Uh, I would like to just personally say to you, Minister, and to your colleagues, uh, the Premier, your Minister of Health, and, and others, uh, thank you for all that you have done during this uh, very difficult time. 
and uh, we wish you well, and, and we thank you again uh, profoundly. It is my uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Jim Wright, who is going to moderate our panel this afternoon. And uh, Dr. Jim Wright is the Chief of Economics, Policy uh, and Research at the Ontario Medical Association. And as you'll soon learn, uh, Dr. Wright is really a, a, a great uh, Canadian. He will steer this conversation well this afternoon. He's had a, a long and varied esteemed uh, career at the highest level of medicine, uh, medical education uh, in pediatrics. He's worked all around the world, uh, much of his career at SickKids here in Toronto, uh, but in many other locations around the world. And uh, I'm uh, quite fond of Dr. Wright, and uh, that's why we've asked him to take on the challenge to moderate our panel this afternoon. So with that, Dr. Wright, I'll pass the panel over to you. Uh, thanks so much, Alan and uh, Mr. Fideli. Um, so the theme that we want to talk today is prioritizing health to rebuild the economy. And as I look to my distinguished panel, uh, I want them to think a little bit about the ongoing challenges and the near future, and then perhaps uh, what you would be looking for even now to plan for what unfortunately is likely to be a future event, for example, the next flu uh, pandemic. So my plan is to have specific questions for each of my three panelists. Obviously, each of the panelists uh, can comment. I'm going to start with a global health view. I'm then going to turn to a more um, business perspective and then uh, focus in on the issue of um, technology and improvement. So I'm going to start with Peter Singer, who's the special advisor to the director general of the WHO. And Peter, since we've started to plan for this event, the Council on Foreign Affairs has released their report in which they call for Global Health Security Committee. Uh, which would involve not just the WHO, but other organizations such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Trade Organization. The WHO clearly has a role um, in international health. And I wonder if you could spend a few minutes talking about what is the WHO's role or international health agency as they work to control this pandemic through uh, public health measures, which unfortunately have an impact on the economy which in turn influences and uh, potentially detrimental effects on health. So what's the role of the WHO in balancing these two, um, unfortunately, somewhat competing objectives, controlling the pandemic, but minimizing the economic impact? Thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure to be with you today and uh, with the other panelists and with everyone listening. Um, uh, let me just start, since we're beginning the panel, by expressing uh, on behalf of the World Health Organization, our respect and appreciation for all health workers and all essential workers in Toronto, in Ontario, in Canada, and around the world. They really uh, uh, bear a lot of the burden here. Uh, and uh, they're 2 to 3% of the world population, 14% of the global cases. would also like to express on behalf of the World Health Organization condolences um, to the families of uh, the 1.1 million plus people who've died around the world. To get to your question, Jim, uh, very simple. There's only one solution uh, to the economic crisis that uh, COVID has wrought, um, and that's to solve the public health crisis, period. You asked about the role of the World Health Organization in doing that. It's actually uh, has a critical role in all four things that we all need to do together. Firstly, we need to show leadership, engage communities, uh, have national unity, and very importantly, build global solidarity. This is something uh, that my friend, uh, Dr. Tedros, the Director General, has been emphasizing in over 110 press conferences since the pandemic began, global solidarity um, coming together. That's the soft infrastructure, the foundation on which everything else is built. Secondly, uh, the public health measures. Since the very beginning, the World Health Organization has issued guidance and uh, set missions and uh, trained more than 5 million health workers around the world and, and sent uh, diagnostic kits, et cetera. But the basic shoe leather tried and true public health measures. Since the very beginning, we've emphasized that at the heart of this is putting the virus in the penalty box, testing, 
uh, isolating cases, tracking and quarantining contacts, and then the broader public health measures of physical distancing, masks, washing your hands, et cetera. Um, thirdly, uh, are the new tools. And uh, here we're talking about diagnostics, drugs, vaccines, uh, and a uh, very robust effort on vaccines, more than 200 candidates in the pipeline, more than uh, 40 in human trials, more than 10 in late phase trials, and actually quite promising. The World Health Organization will only uh, endorse a vaccine if it's safe and effective. So safety and efficacy, but also equitable distribution are key. And those are things that WHO does because uh, you can save lives by providing vaccine to some people in all countries, as opposed to all people in some countries. And you can restart the global economy more quickly as well. And then finally, in terms of the recovery, making sure that we have the resilient health systems, the primary health care, um, to uh, essentially make sure that this doesn't happen again, uh, building in the essential public health function. So in summary, the only way to solve the economic crisis is to solve the public health crisis. We do that through global solidarity, tried and true public health measures, uh, the new scientific tools that are looking quite promising, uh, and rebuilding uh, with primary health care. And uh, the World Health Organization has a critical role in all those things. And if there's one thing I've learned since I've been here with Dr. Tedros, it's just how essential the World Health Organization and the whole multilateral system is in supporting countries, every country, including Canada. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, uh, Peter. Um, I'm now going to shift uh, to perhaps a more, um, let's say, business um, bent on this. And Anna, uh, who is the global head of healthcare for KPMG International, um, Peter talked a lot about public health, and as has become um, clear in this pandemic, public health is the branch of medicine which prevents diseases, so that we don't have to treat diseases, it prevents diseases. So I wonder if you could talk um, about the same kind of concept. What should we have learned? What should we be doing now? What should organizations and countries be doing prevent um, uh, to minimize the impact of a um, future pandemic or the ongoing pandemic? How do we build resilience within our economy to uh, manage these kinds of crises and challenges? Yeah, thank you very much. And let me please start by emphasizing what uh, Peter Singer has said about his uh, very full appreciating for all the healthcare workers who have really risked their lives and who have worked at the top of their games and at the top of their energies to, to help manage this crisis and to help treating people and helping people to get better and not suffer too much from this crisis. And of course, this crisis, it's really unprecedented in what we are seeing. And um, I think what this crisis is showing is a number of things. So it's showing a number of things, both in the public health space, but also in the space of the provision of health. Because, um, of course, it's a, it's a one-off crisis. It's unprecedented. However, at the same time, we're also seeing from all our assignments, and we've been working on well a more than 100 assignments as KPMG, helping uh, manage the crisis in over 30 countries. What we're seeing are a number of things. So first of all, public health is incredibly important. And to be honest, I think that we have very long overlooked the importance of public health, and we've been putting a lot of focus on the provider systems, which are key, which are crucial. But it's just in this crisis where we're seeing the importance of public health. Um, what we're seeing in general is that uh, healthy economies need healthy populations. And what we see in the crisis is that in a number of fields, it's especially the vulnerable populations that are being very hardly hit by this whole COVID-19 crisis both in terms of their uh, pre-crisis health, con health conditions, but also in terms of the effects that this crisis had on their uh, well-being and on their, uh, on, their, uh, uh, on, the, on their status, on their economical status. And 
it was made very clear to me in a conversation that I had with our South African head of health. We had a conversation about the COVID-19 crisis and the lockdown. And she said to me at a certain moment that Anna, listen, a lot of people, for a lot of the people here, a lockdown is not possible. And for them, this crisis is really a, cho a choice between dying a possible death from COVID-19 or a certain death by starvation. And by stating that, she was telling me that these vulnerable people, that a lot of the vulnerable populations, they, they can't even afford uh, what I would call, um, you know, the, the safety of a lockdown because they have to go out every day and they have to put themselves at risk. So I think that if we want to handle a crisis like that, and if we want to prevent crises in the near future, we need to be putting much more focus on our public health system, focusing on prevention, on keeping people healthy so that they're physically less vulnerable in getting uh, in, in, in attracting diseases. But I think we also need to be helping there in terms of social stability, in terms of welfare, creating job certainty, creating certainty for living conditions so that whenever there is a crisis, they don't need to be taking so many more risks than the risk that they are already facing. So that public health and that public health needs to combine both health care and it needs to combine social and economical well-being. That needs to be a very important point for the future. A second element that we need to be looking at is really is the, uh, is the sustainability of what I would call our care delivery models. And what we saw and It, it might be hard and a little bit, it might sound a little bit cynical, but every cloud has got a silver lining. And what we have been seeing during this COVID-19 crisis is that we, we, we ran into an immense transformation in healthcare delivery systems. And what we were seeing in our practice is that actually during the crisis for healthcare provision, the digital front door has become the front door. We were seeing uptakes in digital delivery of healthcare of about up to 300 to 700 percent. Uh, organizations achieving goals that they had set for a number of years. And I think that whole transformation in our care delivery model is crucial for the future because what we see is that Yes, COVID-19 is a crisis, but healthcare will be facing more crises in the coming years because of the aging population, because of the increase in the chronic diseases, but also because of the immense reduction in workforce that we will be seeing. So we need to prevent the crises to come by really changing our delivery model, by stepping up that game of the digital transformation in healthcare, but also by investing more in prevention and investing more in care that is closer to the homes of people. So investing in primary care and investing in community care. The third element that we need to be looking at is really the workforce issue in, uh, in health care. And Peter Singer has already stressed the immense importance of nurses, of health workers, of doctors. What we see is that these, uh, the healthcare workers were under immense stress during the COVID-19 crisis and still are. But what we will be seeing is that we will have a very strong reduction in workforce. So we will need to really make a transformation in healthcare where we start to have a much more flexible approach towards our workforce, where we start combining digital and, and physical delivery models and where we really start working on a very good and strong, what I would call, marriage between man and machine and where we start working on blended delivery models where humans and digital work together to secure the provision of healthcare in the coming years. So, yes, we need to be working hard to prevent crisis like these because they're destructive for our health, they're destructive for social stability, they're destructive for economical stability. We need to be doing that by investing more in public health and public well-being, but we also need to be stabilizing our healthcare delivery systems and our workforce delivery systems for the future. Thank you so much, uh, Anna. And you mentioned the silver lining, and I'm constantly looking for silver linings. And um, while in terms of infectious disease, this is almost uh, unprecedented. Of course, we've had 
world crises in the past, which have um, stimulated innovation and development. So I'm next turning to Andrea Warner, who's the executive vice president for rapid and molecular diagnostics in Abbott. And so, Andrea, my question to you is, will there be longstanding impact of COVID-19 on regulatory approval of diagnostics and therapeutics? Is this a good thing? And I guess we always have to raise the issue of how do we ensure the safety uh, of these innovations and particularly uh, ensuring the confidence of the public as we think of about a potential uh, vaccine. Um, so is there a good side to this and um, are, are we uh, at risk of rushing too quickly? So, um, Andrea. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, Jim, thank you for uh, having me participate and definitely, uh, you know, want to compliment the, the comments by uh, Peter and by Anna in regards to thanking all of uh, the healthcare providers and, and the public private sector for coming together to collaborate in, in fighting this pandemic. Um, in regards to your specific re question regarding um, regulatory, both uh, in the short term and the long term and how we can, you know, uh, maintain the confidence uh, in the system, let me just focus on, you know, that uh, we've been working very closely with regulatory bodies across uh, the globe since the pandemic, since the earliest onset of the outbreak. And you, if we think about uh, how we're addressing COVID versus how we've addressed previous uh, pandemics, definitely a lot has evolved. Uh, back, if I think about back in Zika, you know, Zika, when the outbreak first came, it took us about nine months to introduce the test into the marketplace. So we've evolved quite a bit in terms of trying to bring tests to market sooner. And if we were operating under the framework that we had been historically, we wouldn't see all the tests that we, we currently have on the marketplace. So what regulatory bodies uh, had done is put together templates to be able to provide, at least initially for the diagnostic sector, to provide us uh, templates in terms of still significant requirements to ensure products are safe, um, but what can we do to accelerate by really understanding what is critical at this earliest onset to bring tests to market immediately? And those initial tests that came to market uh, were molecular diagnostic tests, tests that could detect if there was the virus or not the virus. So the earliest tests to market, they still had significant requirements to make sure they were safe. Um, clearly, um, the uh, requirements have evolved as we've learned more about uh, the uh, how the tests perform out in the marketplace, as we've learned more about the virus. Uh, regulatory bodies have continued to tighten um, the requirements as we've learned more. Also, as more have come to market, they've, you know, regulatory bodies have taken some tests off the market. Um, and we've seen that the, the tests brought to market by large diagnostic players such as Abbott have been, you know, extremely uh, reliable. You know, um, and so I would say that the requirements really focus on uh, what we need and, and constantly balancing between bringing mark products to market quickly, but making sure we don't sacrifice uh, safety or we don't sacrifice reliability. And uh, each each stage along the way, as we've brought in new platforms, starting with molecular tests, then moving to um, antibody tests and then uh, antigen tests, each each us. Uh, 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 Along the way, uh, the requirements, we've continuously had uh, a dialogue with the regulators to determine um, how we should continuously adjust based on what is happening and what we're learning in the scientific community. Now, as we look in and vaccines, you know, similar questions are going to be um, facing the vaccine companies to make sure um, there's, they're bringing products that are safe and reliable. And you've heard from many of the vaccine companies about that they're not going to bring any products to market until they can ensure uh, public safety. So again, um, what we need to do to make sure um, the uh, the public has, has confidence is to continue to have transparency in the system. Um, that uh, and and when you have transparency in the system, a lot of the public is seeing things um, that may they may think is out of the ordinary, but it is quite routine. So for example, um, recently we've heard on the vaccine front that there is you know some trials that have stopped. Well, that does happen in a normal routine setting. It's just that we don't typically hear about them, right? So there's a lot more scrutiny in the system right now that is maybe making people feel uncomfortable. But this is the normal process um, of our regulatory framework. So hopefully that addresses uh, some of your questions um, regarding uh, you know what we're doing as an industry to collaborate with regulatory bodies to ensure safety of the products. Uh, that we put into the marketplace. 
Um, thanks so much, Andrea. Um, I suspect all the panelists would have comments on uh, the questions that I've posed to each other. And you should feel free as I, um, the next question, which I'm going to throw out to any panelist who would like to, or all panelists. Um, prior to COVID, um, there has been a move towards globalization um, in our economies. Um, clearly, the COVID, um, through two things, has shown the downside of globalization. That is of international travel, the virus traveling from one jurisdiction to another. And the second is supply chain, um, where uh, particularly when the borders closed, uh, this uh, posed real uh, dilemmas for many countries who perhaps uh, didn't have the manufacturing base that would uh, allow them uh, to produce. So what is the implication of globalize? What is the implication of COVID-19 on globalization in the future? Um, can we continue to move um, forward with globalization? But if so, what are the protections that countries and business need to make sure that they're not vulnerable uh, to the next crisis? So I would want anyone who's willing to um, answer this question. Jim, maybe I could jump in this way, if you don't mind. I, I think it's really important to say uh, that there is hope. This will pass. The world defeated smallpox and we will defeat COVID-19. And the way we will do it is together. And that gets to your point about globalization. We need to work together with global solidarity, and that does require uh, that does require a global perspective, a global view. If you just take an economic lens on this, you know the stimulus spending across the world has been more than ten trillion dollars. One estimate recently published around uh, uh, the U.S. itself was sixteen trillion dollars price tag for COVID. Compared to that. Uh, the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator, led by WHO with all kinds of partners, which is uh, working towards the equitable distribution of, of vaccines, diagnostics, and, and therapies to put an end to this uh, uh, epidemic, had uh, recently a $34 billion ask. That is a small amount. Of, it seems like a huge amount of money, but it's relatively small and highly cost effective. And that also is a global view. And then finally, from a global standpoint, and this was the thrust of your question, um, you know, I want to amplify what Anne said about inequities. Those definitely occur between countries, among countries. They also happen within countries. COVID has been the great, it preys on inequities. It shines a spotlight on structural inequities in gender, in race, in sexual preference that, that exist before. And there is an opportunity um, uh, you were talking about silver linings before, to really look at that situation and uh, and make sure we create a world that is more equitable. And that can sound like a slogan, but here's a concrete example to end on. This is also a global view, and that was your question. You know, access to oxygen, medical oxygen by face mask. Oxygen saves lives. It's what you and I learned in our internship. Low oxygen kills, oxygen saves lives. It's an essential drug. Well, it's needed for COVID. It's also needed to save the lives of many of the 800,000 kids who die every year of pneumonia. It's needed for safe surgery, and it's needed to reduce inequities among countries and within countries. And so um, I think from a global standpoint, uh, we have to grow together. There has to be global solidarity. Uh, we have to actually pay for prevention, uh, in starting with the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator uh, and starting with uh, the new scientific tools and then on to the prevention strategies that will be needed to make sure this never happens again. And it does offer hope. There is hope and it does offer an opportunity to create a world inside countries, within countries and between countries, among countries, that's a more equitable world, a fairer world than the one we have today. Yeah. Anna, maybe I can go to you. I'm sure that, um, sorry, uh, Anna, I was going to say that no doubt you are counseling companies, um, global companies all over the world of how to respond to this. And maybe you can um, uh, follow up to Peter's question. What is the impact on supply chain um, and the like? Yeah, I think I, I need to chime in with what Peter was saying. And if we look at supply chain, I, I think there's a sort of double effect. So on the one hand, we see definitely we, we, we did see during a certain moment in the crisis, we saw 
much more stress on uh, national and regional production, uh, the tendency to be less dependent on global supply chains. However, what I see at this moment is more of a transformation in that. And I think that, and if we look at the example of the vaccines, I think everybody in this world, governments, uh, pharmaceutical companies, providers of healthcare, finances of healthcare, are all looking worldwide at what, what's happening in the development of the vaccines. And we're really there learning from each other, uh, learning how we can improve. We're, we're learning how to uh, speed up, accelerate uh, supply chains, how to become more clever in having uh, supply chain processes, have them running parallel. So what I see in my practice really is that we are, uh, I think there's two, three effects. The first one is we see the need of more efficiency and effectiveness and uh, like necessity is the mother of innovation. I think we're becoming far more innovative in how we can have very strong, swift supply chain processes. I see in all the companies that I work with, I see a much larger tendency to look across borders, to look at best examples worldwide and to learn from these examples. And I think that we all start to realize that, you know, as a whole, we're only as strong as our weakest link. And what I see, uh, I think that the COVID-19 crisis has really been a wake up call for all of us. And I think that we are really becoming more aware of the uh, sustainable development goals and that we start acting them and incorporating them much more in our businesses, be it supply chain, uh, be it the way in which we transport. And so I think that we have now seen how threatening a crisis can be and that that threat that we are undergoing is changing our attitudes towards sustainability, towards how we deal with um, with scarcity. So I think that once again is a is a, is a point in the crisis where we can have a positive learning from. So Andrea, I want to pose a very specific uh, f- facet of this question to you. Um, I'm unfamiliar with Abbott's manufacturing uh, processes, but um, uh, I imagine that the innovation may come with Abbott. Uh, They may manufacture some of these um, tools offshore. Um, They may need materials if they are manufactured in, in, in North America. So how, what, what do you think, what's your advice to companies as they've uh, attempted to struggle with this? How do we scale up these innovations? Because obviously, your molecular diagnostic tools uh, need to be scaled up massively over a short period of time. So I wonder if you have any reflections. Yeah, no, thank you. You know, what's what's been unique about, you know, the pandemic that we're dealing with here is typically when we've experienced outbreaks, it's in a very more focused or regional focus. And so we're able to deploy resources to that, per, you know, certain geography. Um, and here where we've had to, you know, all countries across the globe dealing with this crisis simultaneously has definitely put dramatic uh, constraints on our supply chain and, and requiring us to have resource allocation. But let me speak to, you know, your specific question here. Uh, so when we started developing tests, we knew that a development and launching or getting an approval for a test was not, you know, was not the only thing that was important, that manufacturing scale was equally important. Um, so what we what we did differently here versus with other uh, situations was starting before we even had, you know, tests that we were uh, ready or, or past feasibility, already beginning the manufacturing scale up process at risk because we knew we had to have tests uh, coming off the line uh, as the approvals were coming. And that meant, you know, working with supply chains, as you mentioned, across the globe and making sure, you know, that our the biggest constraint um, is is obviously the the line capacity and the and the commodities and the, and the mater- and the materials that come with them. So it was about um, making you know the the advice is here is change as little as you can. Uh, you know, leverage the current uh, technology you have, leverage the current um, capacity and manufacturing lines you currently have. Change as little as you can in the raw materials. And, you know, work collaboratively uh, with your with your suppliers to help them build the capacity as well, because that ultimately any 
uh, any shortage in this whole supply chain is what will cut you off. So um, because this is such a global pandemic and addressing so many geographies at the same time, scale, scale, scale is has been uh, the game here and continuously um, investing um, and, and scaling up to that next level, working with supply partners. But because regardless of how much we scale up, there's always a limitation. Uh, we then also have to really much focus focus on how do we prioritize resources and how do we provide tools to make sure we're addressing and getting our materials to those that are at most at need. Uh, so, for example, we have some digital solutions, uh, for example, a Symphios app, which helps us see where are the hottest spots, who is being hit the hardest so that we can make sure we can advise governments of where to depl- deploy uh, some constrained resources. Uh, so again, you know, what you're seeing here is uh, the, the amount of scaling that we've been able to do in such a short time at Abbott. Um, to date, we've launched uh, or distributed 100 million tests. These are 100 million tests that we had not planned for at the beginning of the year. Um, also focusing our technologies on those that are scalable, right? So a lot of what we've been focusing on most recently is the scale up of our antigen tests, and that's because these type of tests are able to be scaled up at massive scale, uh, and they're more affordable, um, and, and we're able to scale up the capacity more quickly. So, for example, our Binax antigen tests, we're going to be distributing over 50 million tests, you know, a month as well. And, and so it's about introducing the types of tests that we can scale up quickly and get the broadest access. Um, and that means also um, not only in volume, but in affordability and in price. So we're down to the final three minutes, and I'm going to pose a question to you, uh, Andrea. Uh, Sorry, to you, Anna. Um, One of the things that you must be thinking about is is what I'm calling COVID fallout. Uh, So even if we develop a vaccine and we defeat this pandemic, uh, increasingly we're going to see what's called long-haul COVID, the the tail end of um, cured COVID and the long-term health implications. We're clearly going to be dealing with the mental backlog or the mental health um, uh, impact and then the clinical backlog uh, of uh, patients who haven't been able to access health care. And this is not just on a country basis. Many of the uh, companies uh, will be struggling with this in their workforce. What's your advice um, as we look uh, to a defeated COVID, but then dealing with the aftermath? Yeah, I think what, what you're stressing there uh, is, is a very, very right point. Um, so what we saw even pro, uh, pre-COVID, we already saw that there was, uh, you know, shortage in workforce, crisis in workforce, having uh, quite a lot of strain on uh, on staff. Uh, we did some research on the effects of uh, of the COVID-19 crisis, and then I, I only speak about healthcare workforce now, but this, of course, goes for all other segments in society. And the mental stress from the COVID-19 crisis is immense. So there is a very, very strong risk that where we were already having a shortage in workforce, that that shortage is only going to become more because people leave the sector uh, because people will be burned out. Uh, and, and so that's a very adverse effect of the crisis. And I think you're very right that uh, we will see a very long tail of the COVID-19 crisis. So I don't think we can be saying that, you know, let's hope that in the springtime around the summer we have a vaccine and the majority of the population is vaccinated. It's not over at that moment. I think we will have a couple of years to deal with this. And uh, I, I think in these years, we have to be very cautious about how we, uh, in healthcare provider organizations, in public health, in community services, we have to be very careful in how we deal with our workforce. And I think we should be looking very much about how can we create more flexibility in workforce, how can we create greater appreciation by society for the workforce in healthcare? But how can we also take that stress and burden away from the uh, from the workforce in healthcare by deploying more of these uh, digital instruments? Uh, at the same time, I think, and there I come back to what I said in the beginning, uh, COVID-19 has really hit very hard on vulnerable populations. 
So I think that in the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis, we will have to be cautious of these vulnerable populations, of the effects that COVID-19 has had on these populations. And I think that we will have to take quite, yeah, that we will have to have a very good understanding of their needs and really start to do some work in helping them and helping, for example, youngsters who have missed out a number of years on their education helping people who've lost their jobs. So I think we might even be in need for a sort of Marshall Plan after the COVID-19 crisis, where we really start putting a lot of attention to society and to to the weak spots in our society and rebuilding them again. We can't say when we all have a vaccine, it's over and let's go back to normal again. It's not going to be like that. So um, thank you so much, uh, Anna. As it turns out, everyone's enjoying um, what you have to say so much. We've been given a few extra minutes. So Peter, maybe to you, um, is the WHO working on a Marshall Plan uh, to address the tail end of COVID? Once we've defeated it, clearly that's front and center, but planning ahead is absolutely critical. Um, As Eisenhower said, um, uh, the uh, planning, the plan is nothing, but planning is everything. So um, can we look forward to a uh, WHO plan um, and recognizing the needs are going to be hugely variable uh, across the world? You know, leadership really matters, and that's what's behind the idea of a Marshall Plan. Um, unfortunately, I think at the moment, it's more like the 1940s Churchill speech on we'll fight on the beaches, we won't surrender. I mean, I think we really have to respectfully understand that we're still in the thick of it and the cases some parts of the world are rising, kids are not in school in some places, et cetera, and people are really suffering, they're getting tired, mental health, and we have to really feel that. So there's an element of Churchill here. Um, But yes, the leadership, I think, of Dr. Tedros of WHO have been uh, outstanding. It's been a privilege for me to work there. I think uh, it is a privilege for me to work there. I think that the world does need a plan. In fact, the elements I laid down do represent parts of a plan. Uh, Marshall Plan, you know, the issue is that's one country kind of doing it to a bunch of other countries. I think this is a case where every country in the world has to find national leadership and pull itself out of it. So um, uh, leadership really matters. And so the concept of a plan, yes, the elements are the ones I described, starting with the infrastructure of national solidarity and building back so there's no uh, inequities or inequities are redressed. Uh, we're in more of a Churchillian moment, at the, uh, Churchillian speech time at the moment um, with the fighting on the beaches. Uh, but I do think the world will need to come together. And if there was one word I'd like to leave people with, that's together. The only way to succeed in response and recovery of COVID is together. And this is a place where uh, Canada has been playing a useful role, a helpful role in the multilateral system as well. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Um, Andrea, there's a question from the audience, which I think you are poised to answer uh, in the final three minutes. Um, Can you comment on strategic partnerships that you think are worth prioritizing? You know, biotech and pharma. um, Where do you see the opportunities that people should be pursuing in the short term? Um, In regards to partnerships, um, you know, if, if you're talking between potentially uh, diagnostics and pharmaceutical companies or, or overall, we see a number of areas of partnerships um, across the global community. If, if the question specifically in terms of pharma, I could say on the diagnostic sector, you know, pharma has been coming to us to determine how we can help them get these vaccines um, out very quickly. You know, one, it's helping them understand um, who are candidates for vaccine trials. It's to make sure we're um, determining who has responded, you know, well, you know, on the vaccine front. And it's also to um, keep those safe in, in the environment, you know, the many researchers, the many developers, the many people conducting the trials. So that's one, you know, form of partnership. Um, you know, across uh, the global community, this is a period of time we have seen the community come together more than it ever has before, the public-private partnership um, you know, industry coming together, governments coming together, the uh, NGO partners working with non-governmental organizations, 
um, working with, uh, um, you know, the Gates Foundation, FIND, uh, the WHO, all of us coming together to determine, um, one, what is needed in certain um, geographies, um, how do we prioritize in getting tests, opening funding mechanisms, um, getting tests into the marketplace, and uh, prioritizing resources to those that are most vulnerable and making sure there's a voice for those that are most vulnerable and, and most needing. So just to answer the question, you know, we see um, definitely collaborations coming together um, across the industry and across uh, public and private partnerships. So I want to thank all the panelists, uh, Peter, Anna, and Andrea. Um, I've heard through all of the uh, speakers the importance of working together. When I say work together, I mean from a global perspective. Um, I think that uh, we're still in the midst, as Peter said, in a Churchillian um, uh, global threat that we're still trying to uh, tackle. Uh, but going forward, we need to begin, we need to start planning, uh, in three ways. One, how are we going to deal with the aftermath of COVID? Two, how are we going to prepare ourselves for the next global pandemic? Um, a shift in the flu is likely coming. And then three, how can we consolidate the gains we've made, be they regulatory, uh, partnerships or whatever? So thank you so much for taking the time, uh, for all the participants and for those of you who listened in and um, uh, very much appreciate the opportunity and the expertise that you brought to this complex topic today. And I will stop there. Thank you very much.